Fantastic. Well, thank you all once again for joining us today. Um, we're going to be talking on this panel about hydrogen in mobility. So we've brought together an engineer, a physicist, an anthropologist, and uh, we'll have a good conversation about hydrogen. So, um, of course, I'm sure many of you are familiar, have heard about hydrogen in the mobility space before. Um, it represents a major vector for decarbonization um, across the globe. Here in BC, we have the BC Hydrogen Strategy, as well as the overarching Canada Hydrogen Strategy. And we're not alone in this. Europe and the US and, and others have similar approaches towards decarbonization. Here, however, in BC, we're particularly blessed with really being a pioneer in the hydrogen space. Anyone who knows hydrogen has heard of Ballard, the OG of fuel cells, if you will, have been around since 1979. Uh, we have just a uh, proliferation of companies it, that are innovating in this space, as well as multinationals attracted here uh, because of the, the culture and the innovation and the investment that exists here, here in BC and, and in, in Canada. And so this really gives us uh, a positioning to be leaders in, in hydrogen mobility. And uh, there's the technology aspect, there's the right people, and um, there's the right investments in place to really change the trajectory of this in the next few years. And that's what uh, I'm excited to be joined by our three panelists today to discuss further. So without any further ado, I'll uh, pass it to each of you to briefly introduce yourselves before we jump into the discussion. And I'll start with you, Ralph. Yeah, so I'm Ralph Nielsen, Director of Enterprise Sustainability at TransLink, the region's uh, multimodal transportation authority. Hi, everybody. This is T. Tosh. I'm the Manager of Business Development and Social Analytics at QTRIC, uh, Canadian Urban Transit Research and Innovation Consortium. It's a mouthful. But we um, commercialize new technology, and our goal is to make Canada um, low-carbon smart mobility fleet through um, light-duty and heavy-duty vehicles. Hi, thanks, everybody. I'm Colin Armstrong. I'm a CEO of HTEC. We're a Vancouver-based company. We've been at the hydrogen game for pretty close to 20 years. Um, we have three business units. Uh, the first one is what we call clean fuels. That's about sourcing the hydrogen or making the hydrogen, uh, liquefying it so it's ready for transportation with a focus on electrolysis-based and uh, byproduct hydrogen. And then we have a stations and distribution business unit uh, that's involved in obviously building the stations and moving the hydrogen to the consumer. And then we actually have a transportation solutions business. We found that there's a lot of need to, um, to help groups uh, understand the hydrogen um, uh, technology and the vehicles, sourcing, funding, and uh, all the various uh, elements that go into transitioning to a new technology. So uh, we've been very busy lately. Um, we're up to 120 people uh, focused across the country and then down the West Coast to California. And um, uh, dealing with a lot of the funding. So we've had some great trust uh, put upon us by the, the governments as well as the investors. So we're looking to obviously build our enterprise, but largely help people uh, understand the, um, the opportunities that hydrogen transportation offers. Um, we, we do get dragged into a lot of the discussions of all the other elements for hydrogen, and we can touch on those a little bit later. Um, but uh, we're focused 100% on the uh, transportation side of things. Thank you. Thank you all, and uh, it's my pleasure to be joined by this panel that really represents, you know, from public sector to private sector to in between and um, a, a good uh, a range of stakeholders in this space. Uh, and so um, to start off with, I'm sure you're all familiar with hydrogen and, you know, its potential as an er energy carrier um, it exists because of certain properties that it has, and it's quite um, energy dense um, on a mass basis. It can store a lot of energy as well. Um, there's other challenges that exist with this uh, type of, of uh, form of energy, um, but uh, I'd love to start talking first around some of the innovations that we're seeing in this space, and uh, I'd like to start with Ralph on, on this question and then open it up for broader discussion. Um, but in terms of when you think of um, you know, energy uh, modes for different types of transportation, under what conditions does it make sense um, to use hydrogen as the energy carrier? And sort of the, the part two to that question will be, 
Um, there's so many permutations of hydrogen technologies. We see companies like Westport doing hydrogen direct uh, combustion engines. We see um, Hydra Energy doing hybrid diesel hydrogen engines. Of course, we have the traditional, well, not, not uh, ever evolving uh, but fuel cell technologies and among a, a myriad of others. And so um, as, as TransLink, how do you see these different technologies and uh, what are you most excited about? Um, great question. Thanks, Laura. Um, we know that the energy transition that we're going through is going to be rather diverse. We know that this is not only a change of you know, fleet aspects, uh, assets and infrastructure assets, but it's actually an energy transition. So, and we know getting to net zero is going to require a lot of flexibility and innovation to get there. Um, you know, when you, we have over 2,000 different types of vehicles. Most of you probably are familiar with our standard 40-foot bus. Then our 60-foot articulated buses, but we have shuttles and handy darts, highway coaches, double-deckers. And regardless of those kind of fleet assets, you know, um, service reliability is really, really important. We have to meet specific requirements on being able to deploy reliably fleet assets to get the range that they need on any given day to service the routes that they've been assigned. Um, we need security of supply of energy to be able to move those assets on their routes. Um, and through our recent energy analysis where we've actually analyzed all of our routes that are going out from all of our transit centers, we know generally that the high energy intensive routes are the ones that we think are gonna be ripe for hydrogen. And that's because we have current limitations on technology maturity associated with battery electric buses. Um, and the range capabilities of hydrogen fuel cell buses poses really um, significant advantages. You know, almost a one-to-one -on -one -one replacement with respect to a diesel bus. So it allows us to make that transition. Now there's fueling infrastructure required and security of energy supply. But generally, we see it fitting into those 60-foot articulated buses with high passenger volumes, um, the rapid buses on the road that are currently on certain routes and we're expanding into the future, uh, bus rapid transit where it's dedicated rights of way for buses, double-deckers and highway coaches. That's those bigger, heavier-duty, high passenger volume fleet assets. Where that's where we see hydrogen fuel cells playing a really good role or even in routes that have high energy intensity, right? There's lots of small, short urban routes with low energy intensity, but then we have lots of long routes, uh, rural and or suburban routes that are really energy intensive. That's where we see hydrogen playing a role. Fantastic. Um, I'd love to go to you, Tash, next, talking from more of a consultant in the transportation industry. You look at all different sources of energy. How, how do you think of hydrogen in the mobility strategy context? Yeah, that's a great uh, piggyback to this thing that Ralph mentioned. So the way I look at it is that from the battery electric bus perspective, you're entering phase two. 2015, 2016 saw a lot of small pilots going on. Now they're moving into large procurement and commercialization whereas hydrogen is in phase one, and in Canada, we are getting into that pilot phase. So to have innovation of any sort, you need to have these buses on the road. You have to make those mistakes. You have to see those challenges to learn. I um, want to draw up with an analogy with our e-bus, pan-Canadian e-bus project, where we standardize the op charge protocol for pentographic charger. In theory, these chargers coming out of these buses and going up and getting connected with those chargers works. But we realized that there were so many problems with it, from TransLink to down in Ontario, like Brampton. We noticed that there were a lot of failures a lot of times. So whose fault is it? Is it the OEM? Is it the bad buses? Is there an interoperability issue? But the organizations and the companies, the manufacturers learned on the way. And the other people who learned is also the workers, the operators on the ground on how to navigate through the stress of providing service in the interface of everything. So for with fuel cell too, um, we need those empirical data. So we need to collect it. We need that collaboration to see which technology is working. Uh, even with fuel, let's just say fuel cell hydrogen bus, we are learning lessons that in some parts there is a significant amount of water that <laughs> comes out of this bus and then that means in the cold temperature how do we navigate that piece. 
So yeah, I think getting a large trial from an innovation point of view, getting the manufacturer, fuel providers, public transportation, utilities, all coming together, collecting data, and, and then undergoing that long term is very important. Well, there's a lot to unpack there, and I'd love to come back to the stakeholder piece and how these different parties can work together to help mitigate the risk in these pilots. Um, but first, I'd, I'd love to touch on you, Colin, and we talked uh, a little bit about the interoperability of infrastructure needed for these different types of technologies um, as, a, as a company that you know, really specializes in that kind of infrastructure. Um, how do you see that challenge, and is it, is it something that concerns you? Do you feel we're gonna navigate um, all these different types of hydrogen mobility smoothly? Um, or from your perspective, what are you seeing in this stage? Yeah, absolutely. And I think building on the last uh, panel, I, I really like the world or the words that we have to commit to a polyfuels future. And um, and, and then the, the other point about the, the uh, pilot side of things, I think we also have to commit to uh, moving in the direction versus sort of saying it's a pilot and we'll think about it. And so I'm a, I'm a big believer in that. So we spent a lot of time on the infrastructure side of thing, thinking about Ralph's problem, let's say. <laughs> what, is, what does he need on that supply side uh, to be able to commit to not just a pilot, but to a real adoption that's what, whatever percentage of his fleet makes sense. If battery works, use battery. We're, we're big proponents of that. We're, we're a believer that um, hydrogen is, is needed to, to move to that zero emission polyfuels future. So, so we look at, uh, on the hydrogen, you, you obviously have the supply side. Where's the hydrogen going to come from? You know, most days of the week, where is it going to come from in an emergency situation? Um, what kind of carbon intensity is the, the ambition of our client? Um, some want different sources of hydrogen, some want uh, only commit to certain intensities. Uh, so we have to factor that all into it because the lower carbon intensity, the more expensive it is right now. But as you look further into the future, hopefully that will flip around. And this is where the governments are working through their policies. And, and the big question of, yeah, who should invest in the hydrogen infrastructure? And um, how do you um, figure out the returns on that, on the commitment levels, when uh, we are talking about pilot and when we're talking about uh, bigger deployments? So it's so one of the challenges in the trans side of things is the, the public procurement of the fuels makes it difficult for this sort of integrated uh, investment that's needed. So, so it becomes a small piece of the pie on, uh, on some pretty large investments. So we're still sort of trying to figure out how we work our way through that and bring the demand and the infrastructure together at the same time. So, so the, the federal government is definitely stepping up, the provincial governments and different, <laughs> different ambitions across the country, you might say. Um, but the uh, private sector, is also following a suit and there's a lot of discussions going on that says, okay, what's a reasonable um, risk and investment uh, model that we're, we're going to go forward with? And um, so, so lots of interest, I think, from the, the private investment side of things, um, but we have to recognize their parameters on investing is the same as, as uh, recognizing the, the transit world or the, or the heavy duty fleet world or even the light duty. So, so we, we feel, we put in infrastructure for light duty cars, for buses and for uh, heavy duty transportations at this point in time so uh, yes yeah, so it's a good mix there's lots of um, thinking and, and thought leadership going on globally on this um, particularly I guess Europe and in the US they have a big investment tax credit that uh, really helps on the supply side they're still wrestling around that um, <clears throat> commitment on the fueling station and the the adoption side of things so uh, yeah so lots of great thoughts and happy to discuss it further Fantastic. Um, you know, maybe just, just digging into that investment point a little bit more since we're sort of in that space now. So, you know, you talked a little bit about um, balancing the production side with the, um, the user side of this and, and how this um, investment can get split between these different parties. Um, do you think, and, and you know, you mentioned some different geographies as well that are, that are doing it differently. We see different investment structures um, with the IRA in, in the U.S. that uh, anecdotally as well, when I've talked to some folks there, it seems to really be incentivizing the supply side um, more than the, de than the demand side and generating that demand. So um, do you think there's things that uh, we, could, we could learn here? Are, are we doing it 
the best, or are there things we can improve, take from others, perhaps, in terms of um, where those investments are placed uh, throughout you know, trying to get that balance right? Yeah, I, I think uh, on the hydrogen front, BC and California are certainly leading in the, um, I would say, in the, the policy and thinking about uh, the, the options. So uh, low carbon fuel regulation in both uh, the California and BC are, um, are a very creative policy that allows um, business models to be built and, and business models then generate uh, that interest on the capital side. Uh, you also have a variety of um, non-recourse or lower interest type loans that, that help on that. And, um, and you can typically, or you typically have to, you match the federal and the provincial or, or local state funding together. So yeah, so we're, we're getting great, great progress ourselves and other groups in California. And I think you're seeing a lot of transit agencies, particularly in California, since they've had to uh, come up with plans on how to transition to zero emission. And we do a lot of transition planning with those groups um, and just recognizing then again the balance between the, the battery electric and the hydrogen electric vehicle. So once they understand it, they also can help in that investment discussion. So um, yeah, Ralph, you have any thoughts on that? I, I think the aspect of actually cultivating the collaborative environment between organizations in, a, in, a, in an industry that at least in the transit industry, has relied on a single type of energy for, for decades, right? So building the relationships uh, to create the right ecosystem, how much of a demand should we place out to the market? How much should we ask for, right? Um, when we haven't had to ask for something new for many, many years, right? So I think building those um, relationships, I think, is, is very important. Maybe there are innovative structures by which we can make this transition happen faster because we do have significant goals that we have to meet for particular for 2030 and so being a little bit more nimble uh, to find new ways of deploying the technology faster and making the transition faster is really really important yeah i think one one point i want to add here is that from the investment point of view uh federally we have especially for transit agencies federally we have significant investment um from infrastructure canada under the zero emission transit fund and arcan however provincially we see that uh currently Alberta's hydrogen strategy is a very different model. The production of the hydrogen is very different. It's coming from a different place. They have funding over there, which means that other provinces like Ontario or British Columbia, from the infrastructural point of view, if they have more funding that can support and accelerate this piece. Um, our total cost of ownership, when we do these analysis comparing battery buses versus diesel buses and hydrogen buses, we have come to see that right now the battery electric buses and the diesel buses are comparable with the 50% funding. However, the fuel cell buses are still very high. So to make it affordable, um, utility providers are now uh, the new hydrogen fuel supplier suit. So that price and the cost has to come into play. And then provincially, there has to be funding as well for transit agencies to purchase these infrastructure. So just to add, we think of things in kind of ecosystems now. We have two or hubs <clears throat> um, that really the only way, and to sell you Ralph again as an example, he'll have a robust fuel supply if there's multiple users and multiple fueling points within a fairly local area. Uh, hydrogen can be transported. Um, you know, in the Whistler project, we brought it from Quebec and California, which was, <clears throat> which isn't a great thing to do in the long term, but the project was about demoing the, the vehicle, not the fuel supply side of it. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I think, yeah, that in the, in the ecosystem outlook, you, you start to piece together the different users, the different stakeholders, and therefore the different interest in investing on it. Fantastic, and I, um, I, I agree this ecosystem theme has been, I think, prevalent throughout the day and, and really is really critical to bringing um, innovations and this, this particular innovation as well into, into being. Um, so coming into, touching back on the stakeholders piece, um, Titash, I'd love to come back to you on, you think about, you know, you work with public sector and private sector and, you know, um, how do these 
how do these stakeholders need to work together? Sort of what are the roles that you see there, um, perhaps as they are today, perhaps in an ideal world? Yeah, I was having this conversation uh, about, let's say, demonstration and trial and pilot. Um, what is the ideal size, let's say, about a pilot? Um, for for QTRIC, we understand having 10 to 15 buses makes that's the bare minimum you can do to have a good pilot or demonstration trial because you're not only testing the supply chain, uh, the tube trailers, the pressure from a commercial point of view. So bringing that level of a pilot together with stakeholders, you have to um, share a lot of data. So if there is local pilots going on, there needs to uh, be stakeholders coming together and sharing that information. CHFCA have recently started a database where um, if you're building electrolyzers, if you're building, just put in that information. Uh, QTRIC has a zero emission database where transit agencies who are planning to build electrolyzers themselves, which are the you know low footprint ones, what is the direction they're going or what kind of propulsion technology and hydrogen. So that data sharing at this stage is very crucial to know that who is taking what step and what stage. Same with uh, fuel producers. Um, where is the supply chain taking place? Where people are buying from where? So that there is a gap in there quite a bit. So at this stage, collecting the data and understanding where, where these actions are going on is quite key from private public uh, cooperation point of view. One other area that's important on the talking about the investment side, and I think the whole hydrogen ecosystem is um, we're sort of marching through removing the barriers. So when I was heavily involved in the Whistler bus uh, program, and um, you know that that was again mainly about the vehicles. So so since that time, I think there's been about five million miles traveled on. Uh, transit buses, so this huge amount of proof and validation has come. There's actually been 50 million more uh, hydrogen filling events since we did that demonstration up at Whistler. So uh, as we tick those off, we've also, you start ticking off the, um, the safety part of it, so the codes and standards have evolved for how to build a station, how to fuel your vehicle, um, and, and taking that knowledge that was buried in NASA and the industrial world, we've, we've spent a decade or more moving that into the, uh, the forecourt, as we call it, or the, or the public realm. So as, as we think about ticking off more and more, or ticking off or removing barriers, I think the next one is uh, really largely on that robust fuel supply in, in, a, in a broader sense. And, and that's what investors need to know, because <laughs> you know when we were Whistler doing that, we were charged by the minute for not having fueling available. So I was hauled out on Christmas Eve <laughs> to, uh, to go and get the fueling station going up at Whistler. But you, you have to sort of think through what's really needed on each of the operator side and what's a realistic ask to, uh, to put on the adoption. So as, as we get broader and broader, you're really bringing down those barriers so that investors and users can all sign up together. So it's all moving in the right direction, uh, but it does take understanding of where the technology's at, what are the pros and cons of it, because it's, it's different, and I think that polyfuels future is a good way to, to frame it out for everybody. I was just thinking that there, in the aspect of collaboration and stakeholders and sort of policy, building off Colin's point, um, we have to think that from a transit perspective, our main purpose is to mobilize the region, right? And um, we're in a region that's growing a lot. I think we've grown 150,000 people in, since like the start of the pandemic. And so we actually need more, we need more buses on the road, we need more service on the road, and that's the bigger benefit, right? So we should, we should decarbonize our assets and our facilities and our fleet but we can't forget about the purpose of why we're providing service. And so as much as we want to be flexible and innovative and adapt new technologies to meet the service requirements, it can't be so restrictive that we can't actually provide more service. So it's, it's really, really super important we keep the big picture systems view on where does hydrogen play a role, where does electric buses play a role, but in the service of providing transit to people in the region. 
Fantastic. Um, I'm just going to, we've got a few minutes left, so I'll remind the audience that uh, we will take questions. So if you have any questions for this panel, please go ahead and line up at uh, one of the microphones on the floor. And uh, as we uh, wait for that, um, I'd love to come back to what you mentioned there, Ralph, about um, sort of balancing our ambition towards commercializing, commercializing these technologies, but also um, the caution around you know, the public service element. And there's this, particularly in, in transit, there's a need to deliver. We were speaking earlier um, you know, in this, in, in Vancouver, because our weather is like this every day, we don't have to worry about people waiting at the bus stop. But in Calgary, <laughs> waiting at the bus stop, you know, if a bus is late, that's a, that's a real health and safety risk. Um, so from you know, the perspective of, of a, a transit company here in, in BC, how, um, how do you think about the role that, let's say, Translink plays in that, in that ecosystem and that you know, amount of risk that is taken on versus the other parties that are part of this, this ecosystem, this sort of hub that we build around this kind of technology? Yeah, I, I think, you know, I think we have a responsibility to test and trial emerging technologies. We're, we're, you know, we're a steward of public funds from various levels of government, and it's in our, it's in our mandate to help the region and the province achieve climate and emissions reduction goals. That's in our, written in our act. So we have to spend time to be able to do that and advance that. Um, but we also have to look at this from an overall regional um, perspective, right? Where is the best place for hydrogen in the province, right? It requires us to be very, like Colin put it, polyfuels or poly energy or, or multifaceted and flexible and be able to pivot We've only got six years left before 2030. We want to meet our goals. We want to meet our expansion goals. That requires us to be very nimble and flexible to how to, on how to get there. I don't know if that answers your question. Uh, yeah, I think, it's a great, I think it's a great answer, and I see uh, Titash. I do want to add one thing to this point. Like When we, as a um, non-for-profit third-party consultant, is working, helping agencies plan, uh, with multiple propulsion technology, uh, one of the things is very key and very complicated is the scheduling piece, like making sure your services are on point. You have battery electric buses that has a very different way of scheduling. The charging it takes a lot more time. Hydrogen fuel, even people say that, oh, it's same as diesel. It's not. Your hydrogen fuel tank drops, it charges a battery, and it, again, has to be filled up completely, recharge the battery. So there is a time that has to be taken care of. So I think that is very key. So when transit agencies are planning these commercialization projects with multimodal, multi-propulsion technology, uh, it has to, from an operational point of view, it has to understand um, that whole piece together. So, we, so having a good plan, having um, an execution strategy over the next 10, 20 years is very important because ultimately places like, like Vancouver and BC, your, your uh, service is increasing, your demand is increasing constantly. So, yeah. One more point, Colin mentioned it, resilience, right? So building resilience into our fleet assets and our services is super, super important, right? This is the 2023 is the biggest, you know, fire season on record across Canada right, ever. So the emergency is now, and sooner or later, maybe even this summer, we're gonna have more events this summer, and to be able to be flexible and nimble, it's adaptation and mitigation. We have to do them both together. Well said. Um, I see we do have an audience question here, so um, I'll, I'll welcome it up to, to you to speak. Okay, I forgot to introduce myself before. I'm Elke Porter of West Coast German News. And I just recently uh, got to tour at UBC, the hydrogen hub, and they're saying it's going to take one more year for them to get going. And as well as talk to other companies, like for example, Cellcentric, and they're also saying it's going to take four to five years. To so, what exactly are they going to be doing in that time? Like, what is the what are some of the behind the scenes things that we don't hear about? 
Yeah, I can ask that. Um, I get to be behind the scenes every once in a while. <laughs> so, um, you know, from a vehicle supply perspective, it's obviously there's a demand side of it, uh, whether it's a carrot or a stick from policy or, or the or the you know their clients want it. Um, that dictates a lot of their planning, scheduling, and, and resource commitments. So, you know, I, I think globally the world has to up their ambition to to send those signals. But also on their side of it, they have to go through. Um, and understand all the different elements. They they have to be quite, um, or they they end up being quite liable for all the bits and pieces of that solution they provide to the to the client, and um, which I think is, in my opinion, the the um, you know when you look at cars, buses, and trucks, the the cars are out there. They're available. Uh, they should be adopted. Same with the buses. We've been at it 20 years. We've got most of the stuff figured out so that uh, New Flyer is very comfortable selling fuel cell buses now. And, and you go down the line. So the, the trucks are a little bit earlier. It's, it's a different use case. They are, um, haven't had the demand or the ambition to, to really dive into it. But they're, they're moving very quickly in the hydrogen space because all of the work that's been done on the bus. You'll, you'll see um, uh, there's a good product coming out next year, and they're actually selling tr Class 8 trucks now, Peterbilt and, uh, um, and at a PACCAR, and, and um, they've teamed up with Toyota for the whole fuel cell uh, electrical supply side of it, which is building on Toyota's knowledge on the thousands of cars that they've made. So yeah, so what's happening, um, it, uh, again, there's, it's market reaction to it. So the more um, I think people sort of believe and understand hydrogen, the policies will be put in place and you'll find that part of the solution comes forward. Thanks, Colin. And uh, we are at time, unfortunately. I do encourage you all to... Do you have one uh, more question? Should we take it quick? <laughs> uh, do it, if we have time. I think there's another panel after us, so... Uh, uh, perhaps if it's a very quick question, <laughs> which, which one was first? Uh, yeah, I'd like to have a question. So Quebec is going to have a hydrogen train. Um, Quebec and BC's have a hydro-based energy. I don't know why BC does not have a hydrogen train planned at all. Of course, it probably doesn't make any economic sense, but at least Quebec is getting one. Why not BC? Uh, I can answer that really quick. Uh, we're working on a number of different train projects, so it's just a, a matter of timing. I think there's more trains in Quebec than in BC, um, but if you look at CN, they've got that train uh, being demoed in Alberta. Um, lots of ideas coming out to, to BC. So yeah, it's coming, absolutely. Thank you so much. So once again, I'd love to thank our panel uh, for this great conversation um, and looking forward to uh, talking more with all of you afterwards. Thanks so much. Yeah, thanks, Thank everybody. you very much.